All right, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to our webinar uh, this morning. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Eric Langebacher, the Director of the Society, Culture, and Politics Program at AICGS, and I'm really pleased to welcome all of the attendees and our panelists to talk about the controversies around anti-Semitism and the Documenta 15 artistic exhibition in the Western German town of Kassel. Um, I'm really pleased to quickly introduce our three speakers. And then I have a brief kind of introductory presentation before I hand the floor over to them. So first we have Sabina Kriebel, who's a lecturer in modern and contemporary art at the at University College Cork uh, in Ireland. Um, her work is very wide ranging, but it lies at the intersection of subject formation and the aesthetic material world of modernity. She's published widely on photography, uh, photography theory, data techniques, artist magazines, social intervention, and gender politics. Uh, she got her PhD in modern and contemporary art history from the University of California, Berkeley. Then we have um, Mark Rectanus, who's a university professor of German studies in the Department of World Languages and Culture at Iowa State University. He received his PhD from Washington U in St. Louis and completed his dissertation on paperback series in Germany as a Fulbright scholar at the University of Munich. Um, much of his research addresses the globalization of culture. Uh, he has books including Culture Incorporated Museum Artists and, the, and Corporate Sponsorships from the University of Minnesota Press. And he has published in a variety of peer reviewed journals such as the New German Critique and the German Studies Review. And then third, we have Peter Reberg, who is a writer, critic and curator holding a PhD in literature from New York University. He's taught and researched at several universities and institutes in the US and Germany. He's published two novels and a collection of short stories. He writes regularly for German media, including Zeit Online and Siegesäule. And since 2018, he's been the head of collections and archives at the Schulis Museum in Berlin. All right. so. Without further ado, I'm going to share my screen uh, because I have a few slides. Obviously, so much of what we're talking about today is visual. So I think that kind of makes sense to look at some of the images that people have been uh, discussing. So this is probably the most prominent and the, uh, uh, the most discussed kind of uh, work of art. Uh, it's a mural that was put up just before or right after the opening, or I should say right before the formal opening of the Documenta exhibition. It's uh, by an artistic collective from Indonesia called Taring Padi. It's called People's Justice, as you can see at the top there. And it actually was originally commissioned in 2002. There are two images in particular that uh, have been uh, singled out as clearly anti-Semitic. So on the one hand, we have a depiction of a Mossad agent with a pig's nose. On the other hand, we have uh, a, a grossly anti-Semitic uh, image of a Jewish person with an SS insignia on his hat and fangs. So what happened was obviously and, and appropriately a massive outcry. At first they decided they would just cover up the uh, banner. Uh, and then I think a day or two later, they decided to dismantle the banner. So it is no longer there. And it's not just this particular work of art though that has caused controversy. There already were some controversies in the months leading up to the opening uh, of the exhibition back in June. Uh, for instance, many of the participants, and I should note that the organizer, the curator of the 15th Documenta is another artistic collective from Indonesia called Ru uh, Ruan Rupa. There are 67 core participants. Many of these participants are collectives themselves. So there are hundreds of artists, maybe even thousands that are involved in various aspects of Documenta, which I think is open from June 15th to the end of September, so for several months. But it was pointed out that many of, or at least some, if not many of the participants have supported the BDS movement, which is, um, uh, a movement that the German Bundestag condemned uh, and declared anti-Semitic back in 2019. So in the German context, that 
um, uh, is obviously quite controversial. It's also been pointed out that no Israeli artists were invited to the uh, exhibition. Um, but there are other artworks that also have caused some concern. So um, one of the Palestinian uh, collectives called the Question of Funding, which itself kind of uh, worked with other individual artists and collectives, uh, including uh, an artist from Gaza. I think he's part of the El Tika Collective. He has a series of paintings called Guernica Gaza, with an obvious reference to that uh, war crime uh, during the Spanish Civil War um, uh, in the late 1930s. And it's been pointed out that what this artist has done is he's taken images from existing paintings, Van Gogh, for instance, or Millet, and then has kind of uh, juxtaposed scenes from, I guess, uh, experiences in Gaza on there. But it's been pointed out that there's no depiction of Hamas, um, the authoritarian rulers of that particular uh, place. So that has become problematic. But then there are other things going on as well. For instance, some of the exhibition spaces have been defaced with graffiti. Uh, I think that the picture on the left here is uh, part of the, the question of funding exhibition space. And apparently 187 is a reference to the Californian Penal Code and the particular provision that relates to murder. So it's been uh, appropriately interpreted as a threat. In fact, I think that the curators have lodged a formal complaint with the police um, about this. And then you can see other graffiti elsewhere in, in Castle with other kind of right-wing uh, references. So there's a lot going on with this very high profile um, uh, exhibition that takes place once every five years. This is the 15th, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's garnered a lot of media coverage, both in the United States, in Germany, and uh, uh, elsewhere. There actually was a hearing in the Kulturausschuss uh, uh, of what's that? The, the the Cultural Committee of the German Bundestag yesterday, where many of these kind of issues were brought up. Um, and so, uh, this I think is one of the most important issues that's been going on in German culture and German politics, because the two of course are inextricably linked. And so I'm really, really pleased that we have uh, three uh, experts who can share some insight into uh, what's going on with the controversy. So uh, with that, I will hand the floor over uh, first to Sabina. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, I've got my eye on the time, so I sort of keep myself within 10 minutes and add my voice to a chorus. Um, but since I'm going first, I thought maybe what I would do is offer um, a broader context for the documenta, which I myself found quite helpful, not least because, um, as others have noted, um, there's a lot going on here and there are new dimensions every day. Um, there was a discussion, according to my website, um, today in the Bundestag, um, and so there's more information coming out. Um, so I think um, I'm all for um, the objective talking heads and situations, but maybe I'll, I'll locate myself um, as a German-American scholar. Um, my parents were German, they immigrated to the US um, I was raised bilingually and trained as an art historian in Berkeley, and I think I'm the only trained art historian um, on the panel. Um, and I live in Ireland, um, where I got a job, and I've been, I basically work between Cork um, in Ireland and Berlin, where I am right now, and I've been following this, and I've got my clutch of newspapers, and I've been talking to my art historian friends here, gathering opinions. So it's a very rich field, um, and I come at it not only from an art historical point of view, but as somebody who has had to code switch my entire life, moving from one culture to the other, um, and being aware that one needs to attend to different cultural contexts and how certain signs, will I say, that don't signify in one context resonate very powerfully even shockingly in another. Um, and I wrote a book on the photo montages of John Hartfield. So I spent 10 years researching and thinking about um, 
uh, anti-fascist photo montages in the 1930s and the role of caricature, the role of appropriation um, and the dimensions of mass art, all of which are relevant here. So um, from my point of view, the Documenta 15 um, really sought um, at its, is its conception to, um, it was a generous conception in the sense of wanting to move away from the view or blickfed or position of, um, of Western Europe um, and its own sort of self-referential, self-involved um, artistic discourse and invite this Indonesian artist collective to curate, um, in a sense, take up space in Kasse. Um, and that curatorial gesture, the handing over of curatorial power um, was taken up by a collective that understands itself um, as being um, in a sense, well, it's a kind of post-colonialist and embraces um, collectivity over authority, um, rejects the kind of singularity that the art market um, and that art history is often based on this kind of monographic singularity. We're looking at a lot of works by um, collectives, by groups of people who don't necessarily have individual names but are underneath um, a banner or title. A lot of the works are um, scrappy. It's not necessarily about high art but about articulating a way of being. Um, it's one of the largest documentas. There are 1,500 works, according to one of my sources. Um, and um, they have a setup that involves um, discussion rather than exhibition that positions the curators and visitors as learners rather than experts, um, in a sense, deconstructing the power structures and habitual expectations of viewing um, one of my um, art historian friends was very pleased to inform me that there was also, um, I haven't made it down there yet, but that there's a crush um, and a resting space. And um, there are quiet spaces for people who are neurodivergent um, in order to find rest. So this is all a kind of resistant curatorial practice. Um, but of course the catch comes in where um, it's funded by German government and another source of mine said um, there are 40 million euro involved here. So we're looking at um, very complicated structures of decision making and choice, um, handing over curatorial choice to um, a perspective that embraces the global south, the global south being a um, a category of power rather than a geographical category. So um, it was pointed out that Australia was not included and Israel um, is also conceived in those contexts as um, a powerful economic force. And so the voices um, put forth, um, it is explained are those that generally are absent from discourse that are lacking a source of power. I um, mean, as many of journalists have pointed out, this whole flipping of perspective and inviting um, an alternative um, set of values and um, positions also then um, invited uh, a critique of post-colonialism in the sense that it hasn't, certain issues haven't been um, entirely worked out, like the issue of anti-Semitism in the global South. What does it mean? What does it mean to import these images into Germany, a context in which not only there is the historical um, trauma and horror of the Holocaust, but that it is against the law to, um, to, to represent um, anti-Semitic content. So this is, illegal and hits up against a legal system. So we're talking in Germany then about systems of power, economic systems, political systems, legal systems. And then the question of how much does um, the authority of um, the documenta intervene in the curatorial 
um, work that they invited um, from another perspective. I'm keeping my eye on the time. That's probably my 10 minutes. Maybe I'll step back there um, and let others contribute and see where the conversation goes. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is Mark. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I guess I should say by way of introduction, a lot of my work is dealt with museums, institution, uh, in, partially with institutional critique, but uh, other issues involved in the art market and the art world. So I'm coming in at it from the direction of uh, globalization and museums and some of the issues that Sabina raised. So uh, the, the art collective, the idea of artist collectives uh, has been a pivotal one, I think, in uh, recent discussions. And artist collectives have gained a heightened visibility in the 21st century, not only as an increasingly widespread framework for virtual collaborations, but also as a collective platform for creating alternative cultural infrastructures in the global South. Uh, as Sabina mentioned, not only as a geographic location, but a, also as a critical concept. While collectives have uh, participated in past documentas, and for example, in Documenta 11, curated by Okwe and Wazor, and that's the uh, Documenta 11 was considered to be one of the pivotal uh, documentas of introducing um, more diverse voices into the platform. Uh, the announcement of Juan Group as the first curatorial collective to lead document was received with significant anticipation and interest in the art medium. So everyone was very much looking forward to uh, seeing what uh, Juan Group would do. For document to 15, uh, one group invited 14 collectives, and by the time of the opening on June 14th, uh, this was reportedly uh, including over 1,500 artists or art works. Eric indicated in his introductory comments that there were a number of issues and events prior to the official opening, so a lot of the controversy began in January before uh, document to open, and much of the controversy revolved around uh, charges of anti-Semitism. Um, so I'm not going to reiterate those uh, here. I'd like to focus on two issues. One is the issue of the curatorial collective as a platform and model for curating the documenta, and then also a few words about the processes of reactivating and translocating activist art. So with regard to the idea of the collective, uh, Ron Grupa's curatorial project, as I said, involved over 14 collectives uh, and 1,500 artworks or artists uh, creating a, a sort of collective of collectives, or what I would call a meta-collective. Uh, this concept reflected Ron Grupa's decentralized horizontal approach to collaborate, uh, collaborations, which is also associated with its use of the Indonesian lumbum or rice barn. So if you read about Ron Grupa, you encounter that in many of their projects, they use this uh, concept of the lumbum, um, the rice barn as a communal gathering place. And there's been a lot of research that's been done about uh, how they um, intervene in, in different contexts by using this concept and this idea for a platform. So while international biennials usually require large curatorial infrastructures, this is nothing new, Ron Grupa's uh, meta collective, or what I call its meta collective, uh, certainly took this to a new level that demanded the uh, commensurate strategies of curatorial coordination, communication, and interaction. In his comments to the Committee for Culture and Media in the German Parliament yesterday, which Eric 
mentioned, a representative of Ron Guba, Adi Dharmawan, <clears throat> noted that the decentralized model that they were using extended significant responsibility to the collectives, but he also said that there was a risk involved. Uh, and in Ron Grupa's apology uh, regarding the anti-Semitic images, not only suggests that the group, that the collective that Ron Grupa was prepared to assume some of the responsibility for allowing the banner to be included, it it also indicated that the curatorial model, at least in the case of Towering Pandi's reactivation of people's justice had failed on multiple levels. Uh, as one critic, Jörg Heiser observes, uh, also the Documenta Finding Committee, the Findungskommission, uh, that's charged with advising the curators, uh, quote, might have strongly advised Ron Gruppe that it would be unwise to delegate responsibility for the exhibition to its invited groups, and that inviting Jewish Israeli artists would have countered the inevitable impression of a purposeful exclusion, end quote. Uh, however, my question is, would this participation by the Finding Commission, which did not occur or did not seem to occur, have also led to a more robust conversation regarding the banner prior to its installation, if the commission had been aware of its content. So then I'd like to move to some questions regarding what I mentioned at the outset, reactivating, translocating art, and also questions of the circulation of, of the images. Uh, the apology from the collective Tajing Padi stated that, quote, we depicted the involvement of the government of the state of Israel in a wrong way, and we apologize. Anti-Semitism does not have a place in our hearts and minds, end quote. In an interview with Die Zeit, Tauring Padi attempted to answer some of the questions regarding the creation of the anti-Semitic figures in the banner, which were apparently painted by one member of the collective. The collective also acknowledged that the creation of the work did not involve in-depth reflection and the members operated more or less independently in creating their own portions of the band. So more generally speaking, while collectives must often negotiate between individual forms of participation and the objectives of the collective, and this can certainly lead to a very productive and critical dialogue. In this case, it seems that neither the individual nor the collective provided a critical perspective. So uh, it doesn't seem that sort of negotiation occurred within the context of a critical dialogue with regard to anti-Semitism. Uh, the collective also notes that because there was no negative reaction when the banner was shown in Australia and China, the group indicated that they were unaware of the anti-Semitic images. They suggested that the decision to reactivate the banner for Document 15 was an attempt to present the historical context of their anti-militarist protests in Indonesia 20 years ago. Nonetheless, the collective did not investigate how the banner and its reactivation and translocation to doc document it might unfold in the castle of Germany, nor did Rwanda group for its part in, in its curatorial role identify or anticipate the issue of anti-Semitism in the artwork as part of the collaboration with Towering Padi. A number of critics and commentators have pointed out that this case also reflects, uh, reflects some larger issues involving the global circulation, universalization, or normalization of anti-Semitic and racist images, 
not only by groups that select and use them to promote hate and extremism, but also by individuals or groups who have adopted them without critical reflection or understanding their historical meaning and context. The production of the banner may have been similar to the ways in which individuals and groups currently collect and deploy images across social media. The visual imagery, including the visual vocabulary of anti-Semitism banner, also underscores the mobilization of affective dimensions of activism and public art that have become increasingly contested during the past few decades, and particularly as the boundaries between complicity and critique have become blurred. Tiring Padi's aesthetic practice, including the appropriation of images aimed against Western military and intelligence operations, failed to investigate and recognize the genealogies of those images or the ways in which their aesthetic staging in the banner reproduced the signification of anti-Semitism. So finally, just a word or two about the future of Documenta. Again, I'm returning to this essay by Jörg Heiser, which I think is informative. He suggested that Documenta will only move forward now by building on its more successful experiments since 2002. And again, he comes back to the, the uh, Documenta curated by Kokwe and Wazar, who's uh, recognized as, as one of the key figures of his generation of curators. Um, and, and Heiser says here, I quote, in order to rebuild a documenta in a way that transparency and sustainability, both stated aims of Ron Propa, are not just catchphrases for collective endeavors, but also the guiding principle of venerable institutions still struggling to come to terms with this own past, end quote. And here he's also referring to an essay by Hito Steyer, which is uh, also very interesting regarding the history of Documenta. Uh, I would add, however, that Documenta 15 also indicates the importance of initiating and supporting multi-directional processes of collective knowledge sharing, learning, and unlearning and critical reflection that cross cultural geographies, as well as reflecting the contested histories of local contexts. So multi-directional meaning, not only going from the West to the global South or from the global South to the West, or um, one area to another area, but in multiple uh, more complex directions. In part, these issues represent the aspirational dimensions of Ron Rupa and Documenta 15 that I would propose future Documenta curators might reflect upon and more intentionally integrate and realize. So I think I'll stop at this point. Thank you so much. And third, we have Peter. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. I think I can also make some connection of what you've already presented. Maybe just read briefly about my position here at Schulis Museum, Gay or Queer Museum in Berlin, where I'm busy with uh, collecting contemporary art and historical um, documents, also curating shows. And this is also a place of queer and intersectional activism. So some of the phenomena or the political questions evolving around Documenta 15 are also part of our daily business here, so to speak, albeit on a completely different scale. We do not have a budget of 40 million euros. Um, however, so what I'm trying to do here is somehow to come to terms with this debate, which as you all know, is still going on. For example, Taring Party has an interview in the Zeit today, which I didn't have a chance to read. Um, I followed, you know, what uh, Michael Rothberg and Berliner Zeitung uh, wrote yesterday and what several um, people have contributed 
over the last couple of days. And uh, what I'm trying to do is, I think, to maybe highlight some of the contradictions in this debate and also trying to find some entry points in order to open up new doors or um, new directions for how to um, discuss this. And I will also focus mostly on powering party. And I call my intervention here, anti-Semitism as kitsch, question mark. Cynically, one could say the reason why the issue of anti-Semitism is receiving so much attention at this year's edition of Documenta is because overall, the show is flat and uninspired. I was there on Monday and Tuesday of this week in Kassel. Not much of the presented art kept my attention for very long. Yes, there are some exceptions. If we cannot talk about aesthetics, there's always politics to talk about. What would we have to say about this year's documenta without powering parties, people's justice? To be sure, it is unfortunate that the project of Documenta 15, looking at the world from the perspective of artists, collectives from the global south, and thus offering a fundamental and radical rethinking of the very notion of the artist and the artwork in the context of current global crises, is overshadowed by this event. And both uh, Mark and Sabina have mentioned that point already. Yet for the fact that all of this could happen, organizers, curators, and artists together also have to take responsibility. And this concerns both aesthetic and political questions. About Documenta 15, a friend and colleague wrote to me during a Facebook chat the other day, quote, there are so many missed opportunities, a domination of the video medium, most of which is documentary of art, not art itself, unintelligible didactic texts and a fixation on asking questions. For example, what other ways of living can we imagine, question mark, in lieu of the harder work of answering them, which for show rooted and post-colonial critique would be the more emancipatory route. The show is full of problematic ethnographica, which conjures a neo-colonial gaze that is entirely at odds with a stated vision, end of quote. If we follow this description of this year's documenta as a series of missed opportunities, and a failure to live up to its own aspirations, one might also go on saying that anti-Semitism has its place here, not least because it represents an uninterrogated part of post-colonial folklore, a crude and formulaic representation that serves to support an ideological worldview without contradictions. At Documenta 15, it is anti-Semitism as kitsch. To express this in more political terms, as one of the commentators did this week, Quote, if you appoint artistic collectors from the global south, and if a curatorial collective from a Muslim country is in charge, it's not unlikely that amongst the 1,500 artists, none of them from Israel, as has been remarked, there will be an anti-Semitic representation. And I think, you know, he also means uh, to say this in the most sober possible way. And thus, the artists' collectives committed to their political activism have done the German public unwillingly a favor. For a German public who's better rehearsed in positioning itself vis-a-vis -vis anti Semitism and only hesitatingly and clumsily is trying to find a position within the debate on post colonialism, at least in the realms of politics and media, as opposed to the cultural realm and academia, one might say, this provides a more comfortable position. There's resistance to get an explanation of the state of world politics and the cont contemporary artistic and curatorial vision from a mostly unknown collective from Jakarta, as opposed to one of the star curators from previous editions of Documenta. Consequently, some commentators used the, ones document, the, the one documented case, and uh, we've heard about a few others, but the one that's you know, mostly discussed is, uh, is the one, is the, is the banner. Uh, Consequently, some commentators use the one documented case of anti-Semitism gladly to discredit this year's documenta altogether. The space to discuss anti-Semitism, what counts as anti-Semitism does context matter, is limited in the German public. The positions in the debate are so far away from each other that different assumptions seem mutually exclusive. How can one build a constructive conversation between an international discourse on post-colonialism and the German discourse on the state of Israel? While the one side is insisting on the singularity of the Holocaust, as would I, the other refuses to recognize this also performatively by pointing out other urgent discussions, as Ade Damavan said, for example. A compromise that grants anti-Semitism a special status amongst the various forms of Gruppenbezogener Menschenfeindlichkeit and acknowledges the special status of the state of Israel is hardly to be found within post-colonial theory, while on the other hand, 
the Zentralrat der Juden in Deutschland shows no much interest in intersectional empowerment and multi-directional memory, it seems. The roundtable discussions as part of Documenta's public program, We Need to Talk, were canceled after an intervention from, intervention from Zentralrat der Juden, which claimed that the list of speakers lacks an adequate representation of the Israeli position. At a discussion that followed after the revelation of Taring Party's People's Justice, members of the Indonesian Artists Collective One Grupa, responsible for curating this year's edition of Documenta, were in the audience stating, quote, we are listening, but not further participating in the conversation that took place on stage. What would make a broader conversation between parties of diverging positions possible? Michael Rothberg, famous for having coined the term multi-directional memory, yesterday in Berliner Zeitung went as far as saying that there is no one right answer to the scandal, yet certain things can be said or must be said. I agree with him at uh, least on the following points. Of course, the contemporary German context matters for the discussion, including the heightened sensibility when faced with anti-Semitism, which characterizes the Federal Republic after 1945. At the same time, the temptation to understand anti-Semitism primarily as a Muslim issue must be vehemently resisted. Despite these assumptions, Rothberg applied the metaphor of unlearning, which became popular during the last document of five years ago, Learning from Athens, which was mainly understood as a culture of unlearning, unlearning as the lesson offered by the colonized subject and ever since has been circulating in the art world and in academia to describe an openness to the position of the other and non-hierarchical forms of knowledge production, primarily in the post-colonial context. But what is there to unlearn when it comes to the charge of anti-Semitism against Taring Party and the peace people's justice? The commentator's vote in German media is virtually anonymous. Without a doubt, this is an anti-Semitic representation, and I agree. As opposed to a statement by the artists collective that the representation of anti-Semitism comes down to a question of reading and sensibilities. In an official statement, Taring Party claimed, quote, we are sad that details of this piece are understood differently than they were intended, end of quote. A space of interpretation was claimed whose dimension, according to Taring Party, critics would not sufficiently acknowledge. What was read differently than intended, I ask. I agree here with Michael Rothberg, E.L. Weizmann, and Michael Hüttemann that Taring Party's artwork uses stereotypes in order to simplify forces that are difficult to grasp and to give them a form. This is anti-Semitic reduction in a classical manner and not a matter of reading. Still, for Rothberg, this is not the end of the discussion. He performs a close reading of the two figures, which we saw them in the beginning, uh, in the context of the artwork, and they both work, as he shows, quite differently from each other. But also in the broader context of Indonesia's history and politics and that of Germany, too. It's the most nuanced reading about this I have come across in the German media so far. While the elements of the icon iconography leave no room for discussion, the context, I think, does, and I think this has been already highlighted by the two previous speakers. This brings me back to calling the representation of Jews or Israeli in Taring Party's People's Justice anti-Semitic kitsch. Calling it kitsch has the following purposes, and this is a very preliminary uh, attempt at coming to terms with this, um, to identify the anti-Semitic elements, to name their formulaic character, to place it in an aesthetic context of an art exhibition in Germany, to contextualize it both in Indonesia and Germany, to histor historicize it, and to open up a space for a discussion of how anti-Semitism works here. Yet one question remains, am I, from my position, allowed to call Taring Party's work anti-Semitic kitsch and thus mobilizing the possible understandings and effects of anti-Semitism, and thereby maybe diminishing them, is calling it kitsch running the risk of not giving uh, the problem its full weight and taking the matters too lightly, but I'm calling it kitsch, I'm not calling it parody, in other contexts, I would have less doubt about the limits of my discourse, but I am a German white cis man, and my ancestors, including my grandfather, who was in the SS, murdered six million European Jews. I'm a person with a Nazi Hintergrund, Nazi background, not Migrationshintergrund. Nazi Hintergrund, a term that circulates in contemporary 
debates about Vergangenheitsbewältigung seems an apt description to mark the background of the majority of white German citizens today. Yet, I'm not just a middle-class white German, but also openly gay, a position that affects both my private and my professional life, and a lifestyle for which, in the 1930s, I would have been sent to prison or concentration camp like more than 100,000 male homosexuals in Nazi Germany. Moreover, my queerness is also an occasion for me to work in solidarity with other queer folks in the present, especially with trans and BIPOC, and against the specific forms of violence they are suffering from. While these different converging, sometimes contradictory issues cannot simply be accommodated in the form of one identity, they do represent some of the forces of not only my existence and the historical present. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So if any of our attendees have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A function and then I will read them out to um, our uh, speakers. Um, there, there, were, there was so much that was so fascinating here. If I can just uh, point out two things. The one point that the banner was shown in Australia and China and did not elicit any kind of uh, reaction is, is actually you know, quite mortifying to me. And I think it, it just shows how um, insidious anti-Semitism anti can be. Um, and then the other thing that I really liked is when Sabina brought up the, the point that um, uh, that the flipping of perspectives that this documentary represents also invites a critique of post-colonialism. And Sabina, maybe we could start with that. Could you maybe expand a little bit more on what you mean by this critique of post-colonialism? Yeah. Um, so the idea, real. I mean, the, the idea of this was to shift the gaze and shift the voice. Um, and academia at the moment is um, being transformed by um, a set of questions that are calling into question a lot of our previous held assumptions, ones that are so um, often deeply held that they seem natural. Um, and so by offering the collective the opportunity to have voice um, and to, in a sense, um, initiate a conversation like this um, that is provocative, that is triggering, that in many ways, um, they did not they did not anticipate and wasn't anticipated um it is a way of flagging some of the um underdeveloped and sort of still still in progress ideas because this is this it was offered um in the spirit of a kind of um openness and um you know, afraid of misspeaking, but in a sense, a political um, reshifting. And the issue, and of course, all of these questions um, are um, fraught and um, complicated. And I particularly liked this notion of multidimensional memory in the sense that it means that in the West, we have to be able to tolerate, sit with, and be able to discuss um, difficult topics, which, um, as was pointed out by Peter earlier, it's a missed opportunity for a discussion. A discussion was shut down. Um, and that happens for a range of very complex reasons. But it shows that um, a, a kind of post-colonial openness doesn't necessarily um, produce broader dialogues. It can also um, shut it down and 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 puts a flat puts a, a light on shines a light on um, some of the outstanding issues that are politically fraught um, and that in many ways a kind of um, careful um, intersectional open politics um, isn't entirely ready to handle. All right, that flows into a, a great question that we have here. Uh, for one of our um, audience members. And that is, so this notion of a meta collective, I can't remember who brought that up. Uh, maybe that was Mark. Um, 
And how is this meta collective different from the art establishment, other than perhaps acting on a different set of values? Does it also not constitute a seat of power that is able to include and exclude? Would you like uh, to take that? Yeah, the meta collective. Well, I don't know. I'm not an art historian, and art historians can probably correct me, but I don't think it's really been done in this form before. Uh, it's certainly the first form of documenta and uh, while um, Ron Gruppe has also curated other uh, biennials or other platforms, they haven't done it with almost exclusively uh, involving other collectors. So one of the questions is, and critics have raised this, is it a structural? question here? Is it a failure of just got to find a different structure and it could have worked better? Or which, which I think, you know, avoids the, the question of the contents, or is it a question of the politics and the culture, which I think gets to what Sabina and Peter were talking about. That being said, if the I think if the structure is not in place and there's not an effective structure, then uh, the, the, the concept cannot be implemented. The concepts cannot, the openness and the multi-directional learning and unlearning and uh, all of these things we're talking about. Um, let me say it's more difficult or to take place if there's not effective communication and there's not an effective structure that's in place. So um, they, and, and I alluded to this also a bit when I said every collective has this dynamic that can be productively engaged between what the individual members of the collective bring and what the collective as a whole feels it wants to to, to represent or what it, it wants to do. And there's a negotiation that occurs between that, the individuals and the group. And that, that can be very productive. It can also be destructive. And you know, we've seen that, that the collective dynamic go in different directions. You know, during I saw this in publishing during the 1960s and 70s when there were publishing collectives. In any case, you know, that, that's sort of my take on the, the meta collective, but it, and that's why I said in this case, I feel it didn't work, but you know, that doesn't mean that it didn't work on a micro level for particular collectives that participated in Documenta, nor am I trying to say in a more general way that it couldn't work elsewhere. Um, I'll add one final uh, thought, I think, in some respects, there needs to be an epistemological component of, or a knowledge base where Documenta in the future maybe needs to provide a site within Documenta that deals critically with the history of Documenta, what Documenta is and, and what it has become and, and sort of deal with that in a critical way, not only for the public, that comes to Documenta, but also for the artists and collectives who participate in it. Peter, would you like to add anything? Um, well, maybe let me just say, you know, what uh, my interest was in um, thinking about this panel and preparation for this panel and the, the phenomenon that, that struck, struck me most in in, in the in the media coverage is this um, this impossibility of a conversation or this breakdown of the conversation, the breakdown of the communication, and uh, that is something I'm I'm really interested in uh, why we are witnessing this. And to me, this has a lot to do with the question that I was also trying to focus on, namely 
um, that of the readability of these images. So, you know, like as the collective itself says that there is, that they have been, in their first statement at least, they claim, so to speak, they have been misunderstood or misread or that they are sad. And so this is to me a very interesting question, you know, whether we are dealing with a, with a semiotic text that allows for different readings or doesn't. I don't think it does. And I think here for me, um, you know, again, the, the emphasis of context is important. So I don't think that the elements that, I don't think that there's a dimension of interpretation when it comes to the semiotic elements of the representation. Um, but I think there is, um, there, is a, there is a possibility, there's a dimension of reading when it comes to the context. And um, this interests me very much. You know, how can we, how can we think differently about the clearly anti-Semitic representations in different contexts? So, yeah, maybe just to highlight again, these are the issues that I'm interested in further thinking about. All right. Well, that that actually transitions uh, pretty well into the, the next question, which is uh, from uh, Jeffrey Herf. Uh, he's talking about uh, quite a bit of scholarship, some of which is, is his, about the fusion between Nazism and Islamism uh, in the 30s, 40s, and in the aftermath. Um, as he put it, the images and document are part of the globalization of anti-Semitism that were the result of Soviet era propaganda, Islamist organizations and states, and then the PLO. He says, a genuine post-colonialism would confront head on the reality of anti-Semitism in Islamic organizations such as Hamas and Hezbollah which is not done in uh, uh, this documenta exhibition. And so I guess to like move that into a question, it's a very, very important uh, kind of point, but what has struck me about the debate um, is how little interrogation of kind of this concept of the global South, or let's say the dark side of people um, coming from that particular perspective, why that has been kind of glossed over and um, you know the the pervasiveness of um, anti-Semitism amongst some of these individuals or some of these collectives has not really been kind of addressed. So I don't know. Um, you know, even some of the more strident commentary. I'm thinking of Sasha Lobo's um, piece in the Spiegel, where where he called it anti-Semita, kind of 15. I mean, I feel like we're not interrogating this um, dark side to you know where these folks are coming from. I mean, is my perception off or, or why do you think that we're so, why Germans and, and, and Americans and others seem to be so reluctant to, um, to really criticize this, this dark side? Not all at once. Look, I don't have the answers. Um, why aren't they ready? I'm, I'm struck, let's put it this way, I'm struck um, by a one-sidedness of discourse. Um, I'm aligned with Peta in the sense that um, there is a real absence of discourse um, that is hard hitting and critical and thoughtful. One that um, to, to use Mark's terms is about learning and unlearning and reconfiguring. That's not what's happening. Instead, it's um, an amplified discourse. It is, um, in many ways, sensationalist and alarming, um, alarmist. There's a lot of rage, justifiably, but um, there's also, um, as I said earlier, a missed opportunity to probe more deeply into is what you're calling the dark side, um, which are tricky issues, which are tricky political issues. Um, and I think the, the press has become increasingly nuanced in its treatment. At the beginning, there was um, a repetition of the same issues and the same um, kinds of language and outrage that required, requested, you know, that, that people in power step down. Um, so that is a funneling of the rage rather than using it as a point of investigation, which technically is what the document had aimed to be, was about a series of discussions and elaborations and investigations. Oh, I did want to add, though, um, in the Bundesrat um, transcript of today, it says that the document zeigt sowohl israelische als auch jüdische Künstler 
die auf eigenen Wunsch nicht genannt werden wollen. So apparently there were um, Jewish and Israeli artists um, who are unnamed. This is um, also new information. Any other, um, we're, we're almost out of time. So maybe Mark and Peter would like uh, to say some final words. I mean, I mean, not really as, you know, final words in a significant way. I was just thinking when you were um, asking that question, Eric, that, I mean, that I, I think there's also differences between the US discourse and the German discourse that we have to take into account. And there's also differences as I just briefly alluded to um, in my intervention between say cultural field, museum pedagogy, academia on the one hand and uh, politics and mainstream media, because what you're um, describing as a taboo or something difficult to address in my mind is not, is not hidden or not being talked about in German media or in German politics. I think it can be, I think can openly be addressed in this context. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's an, it's, it's different. It's a different constellation in an academic context and, and in a museum's context. I just wanted to make this distinction, which doesn't resolve the problem, but, you know, gives us different um, platforms of where this is being negotiated differently. Yeah, I would agree with uh, what Peter and Sabina said. Uh, I, I think the other perspective is how do visitors actually experience Documenta? You know, what, um, you know, what impressions do they have? And, and not just, you know, the, the media critics. Uh, the, I would also agree that there uh, are differences between the United States reception that I have seen in media and the German media reception. The, the art media in the United States says, has focused much more on all of the other installations at Document and hasn't really dealt in depth with the issue of anti Semitism. All right, well, that um, brings us basically to the um, end of our time. So let me thank our three panelists for uh, spending this last hour with us today. Uh, let me thank all the uh, audience members for Zooming in, and I'm sure the conversation will continue. Have a good day, everyone.